This podcast is proud to be part of the TalkSport Fan Network. TalkSport. Powered by fans. Danilo's free. And he goes to get one. Danilo! First time we've seen them attack them and that's Brandon! Well, that's what I've wanted to see Robinson do. Tyler Wadi he scores! And the sticky ground! Hello and welcome to Red Side of the Trent, here to build up to Forest's third season in the Premier League. Joining me as ever, and this is something I've actually tried to get together for ages, it's Chris Elmer from the Forest All Over the Podcast. Chris, how are you first of all? You well? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, we would have we would have probably had Matt on board um, because... But because he's useless, uh, he's, he's not here. The other My other co-host on the other podcast, but... Um, yeah, I'm good. I'm doing all right. I'm happy. I'm excited about preseason. I'm excited about how far to plan. I'm excited about our business. I'm excited about everything. So yeah, in a, in a good space with Forest anyway. It's three weeks away from Bournemouth today. Three PM kickoff, which is really nice to have, uh, and at home because we keep playing away first games of the season. Um, what sum up the summer so far, Chris? For me, like I know, I know you've had a lot of things to say on 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 your own podcast, and then obviously with the Forest Focus guys, I know you you jump on there every now and then. Um, but yeah, sum up the summer so far for me. Uh, other than the the your your probably glowing review of England's final of the Euros. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I listen. I ignored the Euros for most of the part because uh, you 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 had a decent tournament and I was getting scared for a minute there. But um, I no, listen. Uh, Forest wise, delighted, uh, absolutely delighted with the summer. Like just everyone spoke about the, the previous preseasons and how bad they've been, and even some of the preseasons building up in in the championship at times. This just feels like it's on track. It feels like there's a real bond amongst the group. It feels like. The transfers are smart business. We're not just throwing crap at the ball, even though we felt like we had to before. Now it just feels like we're really trying to fill the gaps of the squad and 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 build a squ- stronger squad. And yeah, just so far the games. I know this will go out next week some stage, but th- there was a game last night. Um, we lost one nil. We weren't particularly great, and it looked like we couldn't really finish our dinner without a number nine. But other than that. This preseason's been pretty perfect, if I'm honest. So yeah, I'm just really buoyant about the uh, the start of the season, and I'm excited. And I'm hoping for uh, anything less than a three-two loss at home to Bournemouth would be fine for me. <laughs> does it does it feel a little strange that Forest have a got business done in time to avoid a PSR breach, and two that it actually looks like we're getting players that are filling necessary gaps a like example get a big defender serbian man who can just head the ball out of our box um it seems all very very fresh and weird but in a good way yeah and it feels weird that we managed to clear psr without selling Murillo and Morgan Gibbs White and and now it looks like Murillo's come out in the press saying he wants to stay another year and Gibbs White looks like he's going to lead the team into next season that feels weird. feels weird that we sold two players who, okay, I, I loved Mangala and felt like we, we did need him halfway through the midpoint last season, but now that actually looks really good business. And it feels weird that we got rid of a player who played 35 games over the course of two seasons for a massive amount of money. It feels weird that we brought in that Serbian centre-back who was playing at the Euros, who's played against Ireland a couple of times in recent history and I've thought looked very strong. Um it just the whole thing feels weird. It feels weird that we have an 18 year old right back who looks like he could start Marrera. Um, and it feels weird that Sangari looks like the best player in the pitch in, in most of the games alongside Callum Hudson Odoi. So everything is just fitting into place, and that feels weird. It's a, it's a weird couple of months where it's like, when's it going to go wrong? And it, it's it's not going wrong, it's just getting better and better. And I, you know, I'll give my predictions later, but I'd be surprised if we're not. I'd be surprised if we're not a lot better than the last two years. 
Mm. I mean, the, the, we've got the football season to kick off yet. To, to sort of disappoint us, <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll we'll get that in and, and have uh, have that pessimism over the course of the season uh, if it does come. But hopefully not. Hopefully not. Because this is uh, for me, it, it feels a lot different because the last few seasons, like you said, have been so disconjointed in terms of uh, when we got promoted from from the championship. We had to we had a short turnaround because not only because of of the playoffs and you actually get less time there, but because of the Winter World Cup, it just kind of threw a lot of things. And then we also got about a million players. That didn't help. Last season, we we didn't help because loads of players were in international duty. Loads of people were injured. We also were relying on a sale of Brennan Johnson to bring in players all on the last day of the season. We're just so unprepared. This season just has all seemed to fall really nicely. And on, and on one hand, I've said this in the past, I feel a little bit sorry for Steve Cooper in terms of that he never got that chance because we all did want him to succeed at the end of the day. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. So and Nuno's kind of, it's kind of fallen on his lap quite nicely, I feel. And, and he's had the whole squad to kind of use and look at and look at properly, minus Matt Sells, who doesn't really need to look at. He knows what he's getting from him. So it's been a really good start to pre-season and it's really refreshing to actually say that from a Forest fan. But do, do you actually take pre-season really seriously? Like, do you really like look into every game and every detail? Because I tend to not really watch too much. I, I I would be lying if I've said I've watched every minute of this pre-season so far. I've, I've kind of really like been reduced to highlights and stuff mainly because of work and other commitments so i've not really been able to watch so i am going to villarreal next friday so that will be that will be good uh, but what, what do you make of pre-season anyway uh, for, for the most part over the years like being you know starting supporting football in sort of the 90s you know you wouldn't really take too much stock of pre-season you'd, you'd be you wouldn't even you barely check the score over the last few years and particularly since forest have been in the Premier League, you 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 do take stock uh, in the preseason, particularly when you're you're having so many players, influxes of players coming in, and you want to see what they're like. And it was a lot of trial and error the last couple of years. And I noticed, look, I mean, apparently Man United had an amazing preseason last year, and then they ended up eighth and doing awful um, by their standards. So it, it doesn't always work out. But let's put it this way: I, I was I was once a, I was once an actor, uh, and so, someone once said to me. Uh, the 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 bad dress run makes for a good show but he had never ever known that to be the case and I would stand by that like a good dress rehearsal makes for a good show and this is a good dress rehearsal we we are on point we're on our marks everyone looks good we look deeper than we've ever looked before we almost have our full starting 11 we probably need one or two more signings and we're kind of there we have a tight knit squad which is what Nuno wanted from the outset I t- like this time around I do take stock and sure it could all fall apart and we could lose a couple of games when we get in the run in starting off with Bournemouth Southampton Wolves that could happen but you, it's better to be really really prepared than what we've been previous seasons which is not very prepared waiting on deadline day um, you know having a player play three games of the season then spin off on deadline day or bringing in lastminute.com signing so much work you know um and so much which which don't so i am taking a lot of stock in this preseason purely because we look more settled and that's important you know what i mean hmm. i mean who, who's kind of like in these opening few games like i think it's been a bit of a mixed bag in terms of results but actually when you look at it in in, in a lot deeper it's been really good performance there's a really high energy from a lot of players we've used you could say nuno's really like use a lot of the squad, which is good because he's gave he's gave everyone kind of a fair crack of the whip and, and and a fair chance to kind of put their their like pitch forward in terms of what why they want to be part of this squad and and what what use they can be to to do to go forward. Because he does like a tight knit squad. It, it's it's well documented from his Wolves and Tottenham days. So who's kind of impressed you so far and, and like kind of made you go, oh he look he looks exciting this season. Marrera has really impressed me. Um, I've watched quite a bit of the preseason stuff and I was just so surprised by how ready he was. I was just shocked by just how he didn't look like he was getting knocked off the ball easily. You know, he's an 18-year-old kid, so you would think a lot of teams... Now, bear in mind, this is preseason, of course, but like playing against Millwall the other day, for example, that's their whole kind of mantra is just get stuck in, knock players off the ball. Marrero looks good. Like, 
he, he he does. He looks really sharp. He looks fast. He surprised me. Anderson hasn't surprised me because I actually thought Anderson was pretty good. I, I remember seeing Forrest play Newcastle a couple, of, a couple of seasons ago. I was there. We lost late. And Anderson was playing wider and he was brilliant. I think he had a disallowed goal. He looked really talented. And I remember thinking, Who, who's that? And one of my best mates is a Newcastle fan. So I sort of followed Newcastle after and saw whenever he came in, I thought, gosh, he's a player. So he hasn't surprised me because I, I always thought he'd be good. Barrera has. And um, Richards has as well, to be honest. Like coming back from that injury and then going out and loan to Bayern Munich and who else was he on loan to last season? Was it Olympiacos it was? So yeah, he wasn't, yeah, well, I, he wasn't on loan he wasn't on loan to Bayern Munich. He come from Bayern Munich to us, didn't he? Oh did he? But didn't he didn't he am I correct? Oh he did come from Bayern, you're right. And he <laughs> there was one point where he covered uh Alfonso Davies because Davies yeah. got injured. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. But he was on loan <laughs> to Olympiacos. Sorry. Yeah, last season, uh, yeah. Yeah, apologies. Um, <laughs> shot them to the first one. Oh, yeah. No, but uh, I, I forgot. But anyway, he, he's been he's been out for like since he's come in. It's been a bit of a disaster for him. But this summer, him playing in that right, right back position, he looks really competent, and I'm like really excited by that because I think Aina starts. Like we'll get into the starting teams in a bit, but like I would hang my hat and Richards being a really really good backup. And I'm not saying Toffolo isn't. He is, but Richards is just technically better. And he looks more proficient and has a sort of a higher ceiling. So uh, Richards and Moreira, the two wing backs, look, they've surprised me. And I'm happy with that because I th we don't need to fill the fullback position as far as I'm concerned now. There's only a couple of spots left. You really confused me then because you, you said Richards is a right back, but I knew you meant left back. So it's fine. Um, Jesus, yeah, sorry. Is, I meant left back. Yeah. It's like Richards is, is a left it, back. It is a really Reina. It is a really interesting dynamic with uh, Moreira because, like, when he came in, it was kind of like, especially in our group chat, like, me, Reese, Lynn, and Christian were all like, well, he's had like the whole shebang of like a video and all this. So there's like, well, surely, like, for a B team player, they would just like go, the B team would announce it on like their Twitter. And it's kind of like, yeah, we've signed this kid from St. Pauli, who kind of like got a lot of promise and he's going to be part of the B team squad, blah, blah, blah. And I kind of like looked at it and I was like, I think there's something a bit different about this kid because he just like, he's got, he's already got the physique. He's like six foot one at 18. He looks powerful. He looks athletic. He kind of like George Sirianos kind of vibes all over it. Isn't is he it? six foot one? Sorry, is he six foot one? Yeah, he's six foot one, mate. He's absolutely massive. Um, like, I don't know what they're getting, what he's getting fed on in Germany. Like, he there's is some six like. Foot one. There's some like super wheat a bit over there. Um, I mean, he can't decide what nation he wants to play for. Is that Portuguese, Polish, German? I don't know, but yeah, he's he's really exciting. And I think what what what's going to be good for for Nico Williams this season, and maybe even Alaina on that right hand side, is I think his final ball is is pretty efficient and pretty good. Like that's what he's really well known for before he come in. So I'm I'm really excited to see what he is, and it, it's clearly kind of clearly impressed that he's going to be part of our squad like might not start every game but we've got kind of a lot of players that can play that position and, and he's really exciting and I'm really happy for for, for Omar Richards this preseason I really want him to do well I, I like rooted for Callum hudson Adoy last season because I was like he's a player who's got so much talent and he just needs to fulfill it and and I feel like that for Omar Richards Callum hudson Doyle will always get my support, but he's had his year now of my support, <laughs> full support. So Omar Richards has got it this year. So let's hope. But any, anyone else caught the eye? I know, I know, Ibrahim Sangari is kind of people are murmuring now that realizing he's actually a really good player, and now going, oh yeah, we've got this guy. He, like he's he's going to be a big topic of debate this year because I don't know if this is the same between you and Matt and, and any of your circle of, of Forest mates, Chris. But in our circle. Um, it's kind of like we're thinking, well, if Sangare starts and has a bit of a stinker, is he going to get written off again? But do you think that will be the case again this year? I don't. Um, it's kind of a, the problem with this topic of conversation is it's kind of it gets convoluted. Like there's, you know, people saying, well, he didn't do well last year. He's not good enough. Um, and there's people saying, well, you know, Yates always stepped in when he could do, and other people say, well, Yates isn't technically good enough. The, the bottom line is, like, none of these conversations are mutually exclusive. The reality is, Sangari is a technically better player than Yates. He is one of our technically best players in the team. He did have a couple of good games last season. Um, West Ham away, Aston Villa at home, off the top of my head. 
he got injured. He had many problems. He had lots of issues. Our whole team had lots of issues last year. And he was sort of prime target for us to, to go at as a fan base because he was because of his price tag. He is a really talented player. He was playing Champions League football the year before. So we just nip that in the bud. Sangari is our starting six this season. Um, we will get on to Yates in a bit. I know he recently had a four-year contract. I also think he's really valuable uh, to break up play. And I think... We may or may not have the Yates conversation, but I actually think Yates is, is a good footballer. I just don't think he's technically as proficient as a player like Sangari. And I think it's good to have him as a backup. And yeah, I'd love to see Yates even start a few games, load manage with Sangari a bit. But back in the topic of Sangari, yeah, look, I, I don't think if he has one or two bad games, we should we should think about dropping him. You know, I think any player who has a few bad games in a row, you're going to drop them anyway. You know what I mean? If Callum hudson Adoy is playing up left wing and Alanga was on the bench or another backup winger, Sosa, if he comes in, was on the bench, you would flip and, and, and turn the screw and drop the player who's off form. But I think Sangari has already shown in preseason what he's capable of. And even last season in, in a couple of spells when he got a run of games, I think this year... We're going to see the best of him, and I don't think he's going to get dropped. I just think he'll be managed in terms of his load. I don't think he played the full like 38 Premier League games, but I think he certainly will have his load managed quite a bit, and Yates is kind of the perfect fit for that. And it also depends on what formation and style we play, who we're playing against. If we're playing against City or Liverpool, we might bring in, you know, we might there might be an option to play Sangari and Yates in the same team. Probably not, but it, it just it, it all depends on how we're going to set up. But I think in the games where we're going to go for it, which is quite a lot of games, I imagine, next season, uh, I would say Sangari is going to start pretty much all of those. And I think he's really important to this team. And that's why, I'm, even in my head, I'm thinking, should we have a backup six? But we'll get into that a bit. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really interesting what you said there about um, players playing. I think, I think you kind of alluded to it almost in terms of they need to play. People need consistency, really. I think um, Nathan Joy spoke about this about Danilo. Like towards the end of the season, I think he started the last eight games of this of the season, and he kind of looked by the end of it. You're going, bleeding you now. We've got the Danilo we had of the second half of last season. I think this year has been so important to the likes of Elanga, Hudson Odoi, Sangare, uh, Gibbs White, even to an extent that we've actually had a pre-season together because last year they came in so late, it kind of like the cohesion kind of had to start so much later, systems of play, blah, 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 start so much later. I mean, we could talk, we could probably talk about every single player in the squad, but we have something to say about them, I guess. But who who's maybe not impressed you so far this this season in, in pre, sorry, pre-season, should I say, that that is probably will be part of our squad like let's like let's exclude the likes of like Dennis or Josh Bowler or anything because we kind of have we've kind of written them off I say I suppose as a fan base maybe Nuno has got different ideas but I mean him saying in a in a, in a game against Chesterfield is like it's obvious we need wingers <laughs> it's kind of kind of does write those those sort of players off and then there's obviously the news that Lewis O'Brien's going to go to LAFC I believe for on loan with a view to permanent so thoughts um, I, I was gonna say, I was gonna say we need to trim all the fat off, so we do need to get rid of Bowler, Dennis, etc. They're the players that aren't really, really stepping up to the plate when they have a chance. Um, but in terms of like the players who will be in the final squad by the end, there's no real, like we haven't been able to see enough of Milinkovic or Miguel to judge them. Uh, so I wouldn't say them. I think they're I think they're going to be great for us. Uh, I think Milankovic is a really really competent defender. But in terms of like, I, it's hard to pick out because I think we've had a good preseason. And I, maybe I want to see a little bit more from Morgan Gibbs White. But I like the other day or about a week ago, you know, he chipped that lovely ball over for Dominguez, who nodded it down and would score. And I thought, okay, that's why Gibbs White is what he is. Like he's he's going to step up. I'm not worried about him. You know what I mean? Ten assists each of the last two seasons. I'm not concerned about Gibbs White. Um, so I don't honestly I don't know because Alanga's had his moments, Hudson Odoi's had his moments, Woods had a couple of goals. All the starting players so far fit really well. Yates has even done really well. Anderson at times has done reasonably well. Sangari's been brilliant. Like, I'm not trying to be too overly positive here, but I am overly positive because I can't pick a player out that has really disappointed me. Okay, there's been a couple of shaky moments at the back. I think Omobama Delhi can do a bit better. And, you know, I love him to bits. I think he's going to be a really good defender for us. But overall, everyone has kind of met my expectations, other than the players you've mentioned before, Dennis Bowler, etc. 
Huang Yi Zhou's done pretty well, actually, to be fair. I think he hit the post <laughs> uh, there yesterday, but he's not going to be around. So no, I'm, my concern is the whole up front. When we don't have Taiwo and we, we and we have Wood not scoring or we have Wood who needs to be managed a little bit because he's getting a bit older, my concern is what do we do then? So the biggest player who has, has not impressed me the most is the player we don't have, a number nine, because we, we need backup for Wood and we, we need backup for Taiwo. Um, if Toyo stays, that is. So, yeah, that's that's the only thing I'll say. I can't, I can't, and I'm not trying to be sitting the fancy kind of, you know, I, I genuinely don't, off the top of my head from looking at preseason, I don't have a player who's not really impressed me or done what I've expected them to do. You, you've kind of took the words right out of my mouth because the, the one player who I would say has not impressed me has not even played one second of football this preseason. That is Tyro Wundy. And it's not because I don't want to like delve into anyone else's business or or like make assumptions or anything else. But like the whole like personal issue thing kind of shouted at me like, oh, it's a smoke screen that um, he's injured or there's been something going off. Like maybe he's thought like, oh, we're looking for another striker. So he wants to leave or whatever. And he's kind of like, kind of had a bit of a spat but like hopefully it is the whole personal issue thing because I, I, I like him I, I think he's a brilliant footballer on his day like he's just pure chaos um, but powerful can score goals can bully top level defenders in this pro, in this in this league weirdly like Saliba just does not know how to deal with the guy I don't I don't get it but it, yeah with 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 Awunya I think it's just like what what's disappointing me is He's come to Spain and he still didn't play a single second. And I don't know if that's we're still managing him from the back end of last season or what, but like he's had the whole summer. I just kind of thought like I've just seen so many players working on their fitness and stuff. I kind of just wished and thought he'd be like really gearing up to prove everyone wrong that he can go and play 30 games or more this season and go, right, I'm gonna be the main man. I'm gonna wear I'm gonna wear the the number nine on my back and and really prove to everyone that I can score goals in this league and and be a force to be reckoned with because he's got it in him. But it's yeah. just I'm hoping I'm hoping the la- the next two games he he, he gets good minutes. Um, that 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 for me is 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 so important because if him and ro- him 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 and Wood can rotate and we can bring another striker in that that'd be brilliant and and that kind of like sears off to a, to to a good place within squads, but. We'll get into the systems and stuff, Chris, because we've seen so many different ones over this preseason so far. We've seen three four three, we've seen four two three one. I've seen like a five. I don't even know, like five two two or whatever it is with uh, Anderson and and Gibbs White supporting a striker. We've had, a, we had the false nine against Elche, which I absolutely despise. <laughs> um, um, what what do you think is kind of where do you think Nuno's kind of going to lean and where would you maybe lean towards in terms of personnel and formation? I, I think the, the problem with the formation so far in the preseason is <clears throat> Nuno's struggling to find out where he sort of fits Anderson in, um, uh, Anderson or Alanga, <clears throat> and, and how he does that. And, you know, people spoke about playing Anderson in the eight and I think that's a good option. But uh, obviously it takes away from Danilo or Dominguez, who've both doing reasonably well this preseason and, and are both looking to take it to the next level. Dominguez looked really good. Dominguez actually had a good season last year as well. As far as when we play three at the back, I don't like that. Um, you know, but we're going to have to set up like that against certain teams when we're going to try and choke the game out and catch them on the counter. Um, and we do have the defenders for that now, you know. So, it, you know, I think it was was a Bali, Murillo and Milenkovic against LJ on, on Friday there. Yeah, I... I the formation I would go with is the one that he's been most used to. I would do a 4-2-3-1 to start the season. I think, you know, we were very unlucky in some of the games where we played that formation last year under Nuno. And when it worked, it really worked. And I that's what I'd stick with. I think back four is probably best for us to start the season, particularly against some of the teams you want to come out and try and attack. You know, we're going to try and go at Bournemouth. We're going to try and go at St. Anton. We're going to try and go at Wolves. I would start with a 4-2-3-1. Um, formation and I may as well list my team. Is that cool? Yeah, 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 of course. Cool. Yeah, I, I'd like I'd start cells. I think cells is pretty competent. I think Miguel may start, uh, you know, but I would I would still go with cells. He hasn't done anything wrong, and 
Miguel has just come over from and Brazil. I know, I know Murillo just came over from Brazil and then turned into a, but Murillo wasn't starting at the beginning initially. It took a couple of games for or injuries or people to be dropped out. And then as soon as he started, he had his confidence. I wouldn't throw Morella, um, Miguel into the deep end just yet. So it starts sells. Um, and then I would probably go at the back, Murillo and Milankovic. Um, or Bali. If you started Bali, I wouldn't be against it. But Bali's the one thing about Bali is Bournemouth have a turn of pace. And I think I think against teams like Bournemouth and Wolves who are, you know, have a real turn of pace in them. I'd be concerned about his, his pace. So Milankovic and Murillo in the centre back positions. Right back, I'd have Williams. I think he's hopefully going to continue the form he had at the back end of last season before he got that shoulder injury, I think it was. Um and I'd yeah, I'd start Williams right back. Uh left back Aina. Aina's the best fullback we have. Aina's been brilliant. Uh, every time I've seen him play, there's been one or two games. I think maybe against Fulham last year, we lost five 0 where everyone was awful. I think it, but every every most of the games he plays, he's really talented and really good, and he can play both sides. I, I, I love him. Back. He's just yeah, he's class. Good, it's just pure vibes as well. Like during the training camps and stuff, and all the videos, he just seems like one of the most center of attention sort of people in terms of bringing good times. <laughs> yeah, in terms of Bond and stuff as well. And, you know, obviously you've seen the swimming pool video where he's going, look at him, look at him, and talking about Miguel being huge with the, the playing water polo or whatever it is. And <laughs> yeah, ain't it? he's just, he seems, and he seems chill. And he's like, he's lightning quick. He's, he's His acceleration is underrated. And with him and hudson Adoy on that side, like, mo- like if we play a back three, I was watching it there yesterday. I was thinking, gosh, imagine being the right, the right back uh, for another team and seeing Hudson Odoi go past you, Aina go past you, and Murillo start to maraud forward. You'd be scared. Like, you'd be, you'd be, you'd, you know what I mean? Like, you'd be jobbing it. Like, I, I honestly would be like, wait a second, these three are coming at me, but we're not going to play a back three. But, you know, Aina and Hudson Odoi alone and the overlap is is unbelievable. I think just every, like, he, I think he's class and I think he's our best fullback by a long way. Um, <clears throat> we need to protect him at all costs. So, yeah, he, he gets the left back position. Uh, Easily, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and if, you know, if we had a left back, I'd put him right back. So, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, midfield, Sangari in the six. You agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And I, and I'm okay. Like I'm okay. I think Yates is, is a really, is, is a capable backup for, for certain games. I think he is. I don't, I don't think <clears throat> we could go into the season just with a Ryan Yates in the six. I think we need a Sangari, a starting technical player to bring us forward. He's our six. That's it. And then Yates is a very, very capable backup. Um, and then uh, I would have Anderson in the eight. Uh, I think we signed Anderson for a reason. I think I'll play him in the eight. I think he'll obviously rotate and switch during the game. Gibbs White can drop in. Anderson get forward. That's going to that's gonna really hurt, mid, hurt, hurt opposition midfielders. Like, if you have a Danilo there and they know what he's doing, like Danilo and, uh, and, and Gibbs White, for example, in the Fulham game, we won 3-1. You know, their midfield didn't know how to handle that. The two of them were just rotating back and forth, switching in and out, and it just it caused nightmares for them. So, you know, Danilo could sit in that position too, and Dominguez has had a really good preseason, but I think Anderson's potential is just too great, and I would have him in, in, in the eight, in the in the two there in the middle. And then, you know the rest. It's Gibbs yeah. White in the 10, it's Hudson Adoy on the left, it's Alanga on the right, and it's Chris Wood up front, and that's been working for us the last few months before the end of the season. So why would we change it? Um, and hopefully we get another striker in who can compete. But other than that, that'll be my team. Fairly straightforward, fairly simple, no real surprises. That's I, it, 4-2-3-1. That, that midfielder next to Sangare is the biggest headache I think Nuno has. And it's, I, I absolutely love Danilo. Like, I, I think his energy is so good that I mean I watched the POV video and I and I had to like pause it because it was giving me such a headache. It was absolutely like chaos. Like watching, I could. I, do you know if, they, if if football ever went to that point of like, oh, let's watch a watch a football match from the point of view of like player X? I'd absolutely hate it. It'd be like I just feel like motion sickness for the whole thing. But what, hearing him laugh all the way through is is quite amusing. Like he's just laughing to himself um running around playing playing the best game in the in the world so yeah i i love him but like yeah such a difficult one between him dominguez and and, and anderson I, I actually think i agree with you in terms of, i think anderson will play a lot of of his football in the forest in central midfield because he can break the lines he can carry the ball forward he can kind of be like 
what we thought Lewis O'Brien was going to be when he came to us. But I yeah. just think he's so robust. His build, I heard Pete Blackburn say this on the Forest Focus, and I said it, I've said it ages ago. I think me, me and my group of mates who I, who I normally attend games with said this as well. He's kind of got that Ross Barkley build. He's big, he's strong, he can go both ways. I think he's got a lot of attributes that could make him really, really a massive asset for us. And I'm really excited to watch him play. Luckily, he can play in a few different positions and it kind of can give gives White that respite here and there if, if we if we choose to play him in the 10 because he can do that. He's good on the half turn. He, get, he picks up nice spaces, nice half spaces and, and can pick a pass and can drive similar to Gibbs White. Maybe not got us that... that uh, eye for a creative pass like like Morgan has with the outside of the boot or, or the little pirouettes and all that sort of stuff. But I, I'm I'm excited to see see what he what he's capable of. The the whole Yates thing is I've I I I've got a big massive opinion on Yates and I will not not like hide that. I do not think he's a good footballer whatsoever. What I do think he is good at is the whole his professionalism is willing to die for the shirt, run through brick walls. I think that's, you can't ever, ever doubt that. Ryan Yates will give you absolutely 100 million percent of his life to, to for this club. And, and, I, and I can't ever doubt that. But if we are to progress as a football club this season, he plays very limited time for me. But he will be of use this season, like you said. He'll be use of, of against the teams like Liverpool, like Chelsea. I like disagree to a degree. But yeah, well, we'll, well, we'll get into that. That's fine. We'll get into uh, that. I, I think Man, I think Man City. He'll he will he will definitely have his moments this year where he's he's of use. He will come in and he will probably be one of the best players on the pitch because of what he can do off the ball. Not a lot of players can do what he can do off the ball, and I will quite happily admit that. And and when he has a good game, I'll admit that. When he has a bad game, I'll, I'll call it out, and I'll call that out for anyone because I. I What's the point in sugarcoating anything? <laughs> there was players that had awful games last season. Morgan Gibbs had awful games last season. Hudson Odoi, Langer, everyone. So yeah, Yates is just a huge topic of debate because he's a, an academy boy and he does divide opinion, unfortunately. But yeah, what what have have, have you say? <clears throat> so so look, I, here's my thing. Right, first of all, we're going to this conversation with the preface that I'm very aware you absolutely love Ryan Yates as as a person, as a Nottingham Forest player i know that so we're not this is not going to be a sort of a tit for tat thing where you know it's, it's me loving yates and you not loving yates because we both love yates everyone yeah. loves yates but in terms of his footballing ability i actually think he's better than than you sometimes give him credit for i think you're right about the off the ball stuff not just the winning the fouls but like the pressure on on, on the player i think his positioning's always pretty spot on because it has to be because he's he's not as technically proficient as a Sangari. But when he's on the ball, I think his, his ball pace and certain elements of his game has massively improved. There have been moments where he's had really poor games last season, but there were moments where against Man United, I saw with my own eyes, I was like, I wouldn't have rather had anyone else in that position that day. But like, really, I wouldn't. He, 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 he carried the ball and marauded forward for the Alanga goal. And I think the first goal, it, it might have been his skip pass that sort of started that move and opened the space. Um, before it went to, to I think, Langa, Montiel, and then Dominguez. But like that's just one specific game. But I've seen him do that a few times, and I think he's going to be really useful in the season. Yes, Sangari is going to start pretty much most games, but I think Yates is going to play a really, really big part. And anytime we've sort of doubted him football-wise, he's stepped up to the plate, particularly last season when Sangari wasn't, wasn't at his best, and Yates was the one that stepped in. And I actually think he's a better... Look, I don't think he's... <clears throat> close to the technical ability of, of Sangari, but I think he's a much better football player than you give him credit for sometimes. <laughs> and I think he's learning amongst really good football players as well. And it's not just because he's an academy boy. Like, <clears throat> I love everything else that you love about Yates, but I also think football-wise, I just feel like he's improved massively and I, I would I would be happy having him start in the six uh, whenever Sangari's off form. Um, but I, yeah. Look, that's that's my that's my my take on it anyway. Um, and maybe maybe I don't understand football, but I genuinely think he just he's not technically as good as Sangari, but he is still he's still better technically than I think we give him credit for sometimes. And I think we'll see that this season. I think first season I, you can kind of lay lay off literally every player who who had made the step up last season. I do think he was better. I just think like if we're to progress. 
there's there's less of him, unfortunately. And I think it's because the modern day number six now, you look at like Rodri Busquets and and, and all these fantastic players who they, I don't know. I think I, I blame Pep Guardiola because he's just set a terrible trend of of number sixes. Instead of just kicking people, they can actually play. And unfortunately, Yates hasn't quite got that. I, I, I hopefully I will get proven completely wrong and have egg on my face because that benefits everyone, doesn't it? Forest will start, have a better player. Forest will start doing better. Everyone will love it because because it's a, a local lad who's who's been at the club since he was a toddler, doing well for the football club. So I'm I'm happy if I get proven wrong. I'd rather get proven wrong than be proven right. But let's move on. Um, yeah. the, the, the 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 just referring back to the formation thing. I I think. Nuno is playing the and trying the three four three and the whatever else he's trying, and I think he's either trying that because of of workload on the players because they're doing double sessions and everything, and and I think he's just trying to work out what he's going to do away from the four two three one, and and get and then maybe working on certain things when we play against certain teams who are high pressing or going to have a lot more of the ball than us or. Just maybe a different way of attacking. Because what, what uh, one thing I, I wanted to put towards you and see what your opinion is of, of if we try what England with what England probably should have tried a lot earlier in the tournament, which was a a three four two one and with a box box midfield and you can play Anderson and Gibbs White together. But the only problem is is your width is coming completely from your from your fullback. So like a Marrera or a Nico Williams on one side and then a uh, an Aino or Richards on the other side, and you play Milenkovic, Murillo, Bali, or Amabamadile. As I said, Marrera and, and, and Aino, or whoever combination of whichever fullbacks, and then you play Sangare and Danilo, and then you can play, or, or you play Dominguez there, or you play Yates next to Sangare, whichever, whatever combination. You can play Anderson, Gibbs White as two floating tens behind a Chris Wood or a Wunyi. But, and I think I like the look of it because you can kind of confuse opposition and you've still got pace and width out wide i don't like it because we haven't got natural wingers <laughs> um but it could be something that we do at some point in the season to if we've not got more wingers but i do think we'll recruit more i mean this roman sosa thing might be the saga of the season by the looks of it hopefully yeah um as far as formation goes i don't know like i i from what i've seen in pre-season so far, and yeah, okay, it's just preseason, but it's been a decent one. I I just feel like we need to put our best foot forward going into the season. We're starting in three weeks' time, and I, I just think that we might be too narrow if if we don't have, do you know what I mean? Like, if we don't have the the four two three one with hudson Adoy and Alanga and what they're used to, I, I feel like we might be too narrow, and mm. we might sort of price ourselves out in the pitch, so to speak. I, I also think the back five is is a is a bad idea or the back three, whatever, three, yeah. five, whatever you call it. I, I just don't I think that shape wise it, it doesn't offer us very much. Um it, it gives a chance for the fullbacks to get forward, but there's less chance for the overlap because you don't have Hudson Adoy or Alanga coming into play on either side. That that that's sort of Christmas tree formation gets a bit narrower. I yeah. I, I think we have to we you just have a lot of midfielders and yeah. <laughs> because because we have and I thought we needed a midfielder before I saw preseason because we have Dominguez and Danilo um potentially you know rotating in off the bench for Anderson whenever they come on the pitch like and uh, and because they're Dominguez and Danilo are now backups it it means we're trying to fit them in and I don't think we should be doing that I think we should be playing our strongest formation uh, based on our front line, which has done really well, Elanga, Hudson Adoy, Gibbs White, Wood, and stick to that and then try and fill in the blanks behind it in the midfield. And whoever takes the six takes the six, probably Sangari. Whoever takes the eight takes the eight, probably Anderson. And that's it. We've just got to be competitive and, and you know, that's it. I, I just don't, I don't see the point in flipping the formation just yet. If it's not yeah, working no. the first three games, great, but let's go in comfortable. We're already settled. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the 4 2 3 one, let, let, me, let me get it straight because that, that is the best formation we've got for our, our side and the players that we've got. I, I was just suggesting something that I think what Nuno is trying to do in terms of kind of seeing what, what we can do in certain situations if we've not got 
players or something goes wrong because you you got kind of got to be prepared for everything. And I think Nuno is. Oh right, yeah. yeah. I think he's really. I think he's learned a lot from his time away from from the Premier League, and I think last season he he was a little bit cold towards supporters um, and and everything else. And I think that came with the pressure of what his task was, and then obviously the deduction and everything else. I think it did take its toll a little on on the squad uh, with with morale and everything else. And now it's a clean slate; everything looks rosy. Um, what's your what's your thoughts on Nuno? Because I, I don't think I've ever really spoke to you about him. I know you obviously you was a huge, huge Chris Cooper, uh, Chris Cooper, Steve Cooper fan, uh, as we all Chris were. Cooper is a, an Oscar winning actor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was all obviously a big, big, big Steve Cooper fan this season. He is he's going to be in a different dugout for for another Midlands team, uh, little old Leicester City. <laughs> um, so yeah, what what's your thoughts on Nuno? Are you are you warming to him? Do you think he will? Do well this season. Yeah, I, I I like Nuno a lot. My my worry, um, sort of midway through last season when we were getting rid of Steve Cooper was, you know, uh, finally we had a manager that we could really identify with who done just just wonderful stuff with the club. And I my biggest fear was uh, another manager would come in, um, and things would be affected to a degree, but not make that much of a difference. And at the beginning. There was obviously that new manager bounce against Newcastle and Man United, but then at the beginning, just after it, heading into January, February, March, we really did struggle to pick up wins. And I thought, well, this isn't very much different to what we'd seen under Cooper. Results-wise, performance-wise, we were a lot better under Nuno. So that was my biggest fear. Um, and then the PSR stuff didn't help, to be fair. Cooper never had to go through that. Maybe he knew about it before, but Nuno did actually have to, to bear that cross and go through it. So have to give him credit there. I really like him. I really like him. I've been proven wrong about how much he's improved the performances because he's improved the performances of the same team halfway through a season exponentially. We've been playing a lot better under Nuno. Um, there's a clear plan. There's better football, which I'm sure you'll love, Adam. <laughs> I don't really care about good football. I care about winning. So if we play <laughs> crap and beat a team 1-0, I just don't care. I'm from Ireland. I've watched it my whole life with the Republic of Ireland team. I don't care. Get me the Shane Long goal against Germany and sit back and do nothing. So, I, yeah, for me, I, 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 don't, I don't care about good football. I care about winning, um, which is, sounds a bit ridiculous, but it's the truth. have to be honest. Uh, and that's what I thought Cooper was going to bring us. But Nuno's brought us good football, a better system, uh, more cohesion. You know, he's 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 leveled up Gibbs White again. He's leveled up Hudson Adoy's performances. He's leveled up Chris Wood, and I'm really really happy about him. And back in the last season, for him to keep us up six points clear and clear on goal difference with the deduction in play, so technically it was ten points clear. It's pretty good going. Like it was less points than we got the season before, but ultimately he finished that season really, I think, pretty strongly and was under an enormous amount of pressure. There was a load of games that we could have lost out on. That Sheffield United game, we went 1-0 down and we were playing awful in the first half. And his in-game management was really good and he got them back on track and we ended up battering them 3-1 and walking out there smiling. So I, I overall, sorry to go along the timeline, but overall... I'm I'm really happy with Nuno and I want him to stay for the season. Now look, if he if he starts the season first couple of months, not great. I think he's gonna be under massive pressure and they'll just pull the trigger. But I don't think that's gonna happen. Hmm. I think he's now dealt with the worst of the fire, so to speak. He's he's dealt with the six months where he was under huge pressure to keep a team up that he was expected to keep up, even with a deduction. <clears throat> and I think he's gonna go from strength to strength. Uh, and his experiences has to be accounted for. You know, <clears throat> what he did with Wolves was unbelievable. Didn't he get them the European places? Yeah. Um, then went into Spurs and did well to start and then got sacked, but he, he, he'll he have a chip in his shoulder about that, which is great. I, I, I'm I really happy with, with what he's done. Even some of the backroom staff he's brought in, I don't know enough about them, but you can kind of tell that he's brought certain people in that have made a massive difference in terms of how we play and... Yeah, I'm. I'm really, really, really happy with him. What about you? I mean, I I don't know what the coach's name is. I'll have to I'll have to double check. But he's a a bold fellow with a with glasses and a little little 
goatee here. Uh, he seems like an well, absolute... he's bald and he's got a bit of a goatee. He must be killed, right? <laughs> he, uh, oh, he's got glasses though, so you're oh, okay. <laughs> you're well, I that glasses on, but yeah, <laughs> um, uh, what do you call it? He seems like an absolute brilliant character amongst the dressing room, and like he just seems like a re- very, very bubbly sort of character to ha- have there. And I, what, what I think I do like, um, with, with Nuno is I, I get that this can go this can go both ways and and both things can be true with this statement that I'm about to say when stuff was not quite going right with Cooper in terms of officials or something on the pitch you, you never really see him blow his lid he kind of like would stand sometimes he would just like kind of like blow out his cheeks kind of thing what I like about Nuno is some of his staff were getting yellow carded and and kind of like getting told off by referees because they were blowing their lid like they've shown a little bit of like we are not happy with what's going on whether it's an official whether it's something on the pitch in terms of our players or trying to protect our players because of poor challenges or what whatever else but I get also he can be quite a cool character as well and show that calmness I like seeing both sides of of his personality and I think we saw a little bit of a of a glimpse towards the end, obviously when we was at Burnley and him kind of getting shoved towards the crowd and everyone singing about um, Spanish beers towards him or Portuguese beers or whatever, like you Estrella and Madri and everything else. So I think this season we might see a kind of a different guy in ter- terms of like that fan manager connection. What I do like and statistically what I like is last season we were the fifth best non like, n- not like, what was it non set piece XG team like open play? We were we were brilliant at defending, so we were the fifth best team in in the league. That is, that is in black and white. Last season we were I think only five teams improved on on uh, XG last season as well over the course of the season. We improved it massively, and we created so many more chances. Like you you mentioned, Hudson Odoi improved, Gibbs White improved because he put him back in the ten. Wood improved massively. I think even Nico Williams took his game to another level. I thought Alaina come back strong from from Afcon after a little bit of an absence. I thought he even improved Ryan Yates. To be fair, Chris, as much as I Good don't man. always like him, I think he improved him. Good um, old Yatesy. Yeah, um, and who was it that gave Yatesy a start? Roy Keane and Martin O'Neill, Irish <laughs> legends. <laughs> um, and and Diet Coke Gate, um, or whatever you want to call it, I don't know, if that's <laughs> whatever that is. Um, but yeah, so I I think I'm, I'm excited to see what what he would do. Like you say, he's got a chip on his shoulder about the Spurs thing, but I think we kind of suit him in terms of like club size and kind of that kind of fan base because we're kind of similar to Wolves in terms of we've got a similar size stadium. We're both from like different parts of the Midlands. Um, we've obviously had a big influx of of. European players, they, they had obviously like uh, Ruben Neves and Jao Martinho and, and all that sort of thing. And I kind of think we can get on that trajectory with, with him in charge. I don't see why not. Um, and I think him identifying, I mean, like what killed Cooper was in play. Why was he playing Gibbs White out wide? Trying to shoe on in players because he was so scared. The, the, the one thing I think Nuno really identified and changed straight away was we've got good players. We are a Premier League side. Let's bloody play like one, and we did. We looked like a Premier League side for majority of the games he we we had with him last season. So, I'm very very excited. Um, I think we've both kind of said where we need to strengthen in terms of a winger and a striker. So we'll kind of move on to like the early predictions slash the forest all over of red hot takes. Have you what what have you got for me? What what first of all, I want to know. Where do you think Forest will finish this season? In like you can kind of like make it a, a bit of a range, like like a, in terms of like do you think we'll finish like between like twelfth and sixteenth? No, kind I'll of, just give you a position. Region? Go on. I think Forest will finish thirteenth. I was going to say thirteenth. That's, that's quite. I, I, think that, I think that'll be quite respectable and show a lot of progress, Very. whether it matches. Maranakis's ambitions. That's my only worry. I, I don't know what you think. But, but I think Maranakis has to understand that he's not forking out loads of money this summer for players to improve Nuno's squad to a degree where we get a top 10 position. He's just now being smarter in terms of, well, it's not just Maranakis, it's all the recruitment and everything, but they're just being a little bit smarter and trying to filling in the blanks and improving us, you know, exponentially, but three or four places, which is, which is a big deal. I don't think we're 
a top 10 side yet. It doesn't mean we can't get top 10. It's possible. If we end up getting a run of games together and beat all the teams that we can beat, then we will be top 10. But I think 13th would be a huge jump. And then you can take that next step next year. The club's gone through a load of changes. Do you know what I mean? Like the last two years, it's gone through a crazy amount of changes, which Steve Cooper, as a manager at the time, handled unbelievably well. But now we've had a fresh start with Nuno. And next season, if we get anything, if we get anything above 15th, we should be reasonably happy. Like we should be reasonably happy. We're out of a relegation battle, technically. Anyone 15th and above wasn't really in a relegation battle last season. And we we should be really, really happy with that. Um and, you know, I'm really excited to see these other teams come up like Ipswich and spend loads of money, but the narrative of it is it's okay because th they did it differently. Yeah, whatever, right? They're spending loads of cash. Fair play to them for going on it. But I'm really excited to see some of these other teams like Ipswich and Leicester and Southampton I'm, I, I struggle a bit as soon as they come up. And we've now built, and I'm, I'm excited to see Bournemouth and Brentford drop off. And I think we're going to be in that sort of 13th spot. And... I don't. I actually would be surprised if we were below fifteenth. Do you think we'll have a good cup run in both cups? I don't really care. That's like I don't care unless we have a chance of winning the FA Cup or League Cup. I really loved the League Cup semi final a couple of seasons ago. I really loved getting as far as we could. But like, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Man United fan where I care so much about domestic trophies and I'm a bit deluded. Do you know what I mean? Like, I genuinely think the league is what's important to us. Cup will be to play all those other players that we haven't managed to play, and we'll have a bit of a deeper squad to do that. I love a bit of a cup run, but ultimately, only if it's going to bring me like close to a final or something, um, where we have a chance of winning it, which I don't think will be too far away, to be honest. I think we're a season or two away from potentially, you know, getting to a domestic final. That might sound ridiculous, but it's 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 not that you know Coventry were in the semi final last year. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's it's doable. Um, but no, I don't really, I, I want to focus on the league. I want to build and consolidate. We spent 23 years outside this league. But having a third season in the Premier League is just amazing. Sometimes I just walk down the street and go, oh my God, yeah, yeah. Forest in the Premier League again. This is great. <laughs> I just think about it and I go, oh my God. Yeah, no, okay, well, let's make sure we do that again. Let's make sure we do that again. And that's that's kind of all that matters to me. You could give me 10 years of this um, and I'd want to see progression, but I'd just be happy that we're in the league, you know? Yeah. It makes me quite happy that you say that um, as someone that's living not in the city because I kind of drive around and go, oh, yeah, we're a Premier League club. Like, this is a Premier League city. Like, and we've obviously still got, like, I I, I don't hate Notts County like maybe some people do or Notts County haters, but I go, and we've got the oldest pre professional club as well in this city. We've got an admin traffic, like, I mean, I'm not a cricket fan either, but we've got a mint cricket ground as well. Like, it's, it's, such, a, it's, such, it's such a cool thing to be part of, really, like. Big, big part of the of the culture of of, of Nottingham and, and sport, which is lovely. Um, who do you think will be captain this season? I think, I think Yates will be the captain, and Gibbs White will be the voice, and that's because I think Yates will play fairly reasonable, sizable part in 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 the season. I think the captain should be Gibbs White because I believe that he's going to be playing every single game that he's fit. And I believe you need the captain to be a player that leads by example and plays every single game. Yates isn't going to play every single game. So I personally believe it should be Gibbs White captain, vice captain Yates. And this is no disrespect to Joe Worrell. I love him to bits. Obviously, he was he was off on loan last season and he's probably probably going to go. And maybe, maybe he'll stay as a fifth, sixth choice backup centre-back, which I'd be really happy with. But I think you need your captain to be playing week in, week out um, to create that sort of squad harmony i just think it's the i think it's the right thing to do you know if yates and warrell were starting more regularly they would be nailed on captains for me but they're not and mm. for that reason gibbs white should be the captain so i'm gonna say i think yates will be captain and gibbs white will be voice but i'd like to see gibbs white be the captain and yates I, voice i think i probably agree with that and i also think giving it gibbs white kind of Gives him that reassurance that he is the main man of this squad. And I think he really likes, I think I read that in an interview, he really likes being the main man. And I think that kind of gives his ego a little bit of a boost and kind of almost gives us a bit of a, a bit of leverage if we said to him next season, like, like, can we sit down? Can we, re, can we look at your contract? Can we extend that? 
because you're our club captain. We want you to be here for the long term projects, yada yada. And then you kind of like, kind of, I don't know, you, sometimes you can use that. Sometimes you might think, well, actually, I'm going to go. And I don't know, it could be, it could be a good talking point, I suppose, in, in the boardroom when, when that comes to that sort of thing. But yeah, um, before I get a red hot take from you, Chris, can I get a, I want a forest pet peeve. And I'll tell you mine. It's Nico Williams being number seven. Because why is a right back number seven? It really annoys me. Can we please get it changed, Forrest? <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't really paid too much attention for the numbers. Seven's a winger, right? Um, yeah, I've got to be a so, winger. So what is what? What are the positions? Well, Lewis, Grab, Lewis Grabben played centre forward as a seven, but he he, he repped it well because he kept scoring, so it was fine. Right. Well, let's, let's quickly just if you don't mind humouring me for a second, let's go through the numbers on the pitch and like if we were to play our formation four two three one. What were the numbers and what should they be from start to finish? One, the goalkeeper. Two is the right back. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Three left yeah. back. What's left back? Three. Yeah. Yeah. So and then four, four and five. Six is your defensive midfielder. Yeah. Um, and eight, eight is would be the Anderson in a low Dominguez role. And then seven's the winger. Eleven's the other winger. And then it's nine and ten. Right. Yeah. Ten and nine. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. For me, so. It would be. Yeah. So I think. Yeah, I mean, who's our two right now? Uh, no one, I don't think. I think then, last... There you go. Change it. Who, who was it? I don't even know. I can't remember. Yeah, it's a, that's what I'm saying is, who's our number two? Let's find out, right? I, was gonna, I, mean, I don't want to waste I'm, your time here. Let's let's Google. Come on. This is great Yeah, content. let's Google this up and, and see where content. we are, right? <laughs> uh, forest, squad numbers. Everyone could probably hear this type in, but yeah. this is great content. Like, yeah, I apologize is, everyone for, for making them do this. Who is number two? I, 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 I'm gonna guess it's like Julian Bianconi. We've never changed it. <laughs> so, uh, let's have a look. Warrell's four, right? That makes sense. Oh, for, for this bloody internet. What, right? <laughs> um, it's just a mess. We haven't got so Warrell's four. Richard's 27. Oh, my God, he's 32. Aina's 43. Like, we're all up in the 40s. Marillo's 40. Bolly's 30. Well, Marillo's going to change to five. Uh, right, yeah, no, of course he is. Sorry. Thanks, um, they're all they're all like twenty. Like Danilo's twenty eight. We're like one of them like Portuguese sides where we've got like a number sixty seven, and you're like, what the heck is yeah. going on, guys? <laughs> Jeez, we haven't even got the low numbers really, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if someone could tell us who number two is. That'd be great. I reckon it was um, like Mohamed Dreamer or whatever his name is. Who was? <laughs> yeah, could be, could be anyone. Madraga or whatever his name was. Chris Gunter. <laughs> I don't think Chris Gunter was number two, was he? <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember. I can't, but he was, he was, I can't he was a legend. But yeah, no. What's it? What's a forest pet peeve of yours? I think the pet peeve for me is, gosh, what's a forest pet peeve of mine? Um, God, it's, it's more kind of based around sort of the feeling and sort of what what the fan base's expectations switching every five minutes. Like oh, yeah, one minute no, we we flip flap, don't we? Oh, just a flip flop of our expectations. Like, look, we've got to recognize where we are. And then everyone's like, no, we don't. And then we, we lose, we, we win a game. And it's like, yeah, we're the best team in the world. And it's, you know, it's more like that. And I'm, I'm guilty of that. Um, I would say more than anything. But, um, oh, I don't know. I don't really have a forest pet peeve other than like sort of the expectations we put on ourselves. And that's been drilled into us over the course of the last. 30 years where we've always messed it up and my biggest pet peeve is like sitting in, and I get like this I'm actually the worst at this my biggest pet peeve is me doing this is sitting watching Forrest going oh no we're going to do a Forrest again we're going to panic we're going to hit the panic button and every fan in the ground thinks oh we're going to bottle it which we've done <laughs> so many times over the years so my biggest pet peeve is that feeling and I hope that we can as a fan base, change that now and move forward. And the script is written and it's torn up and the Sheffield United of 2003 is over because of the Sheffield United of 2022. And we can build and, and be a club that doesn't have that panic button inside us anymore. That's my biggest pet peeve. I think that's like every football fan like ever. I don't Forrest think. are different though. We are. <laughs> we do it more than anyone. We do it. I've, I remember in Canada when I was living there, sat in the Toronto Trickies and we were, we were beating a team and they got a corner and one of the lads behind me goes, oh, this is horrible, isn't it? And I'm like, we're winning 2-0. We it's not a bit, we're going to be okay, you know. But I'm, I'm more guilty of that than anyone. So, yeah. I, um, I think like the last three years, you kind of have to give, it's, it's so funny 
uh, saying this because online and probably in the streets and in the pubs, it is very much like that. It's very like, oh, oh God, like we're going to bottle it. But in the stadium, it's been really, really like opposite in terms of like when the chips have been down, the fans have really got behind us. I mean, we've stopped singing on and off the pitch so much because of the whole PSR thing. Although it would be very ironic and quite humorous to actually start singing that. We could start singing that again this year because we've sorted that out. Like we're, we're all right. Off the pitch, we're looking quite rosy, weirdly. Like we're signing we're signing Tim Cahill's son. Uh, we're signing Brazilian wonder kids. Um, yeah. It's all it's all looking it's all looking good. Um, so yeah, by the way, like, you're I, right. You're right about the stadium stuff. Like anytime I've gone over to the game in the last couple of years, even when Forest have been sort of down and out, or you know against Newcastle, we bottled it. I was at that game, but I was also at the Man United game where you know Turner makes a mistake, and I know some of the fans turned on him that day in the stadium, but a lot of fans just stepped it up again and said we can beat this team, and we did. I think in the stadium we are the best fans, and even if we panic. We, we 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 managed to turn it around, which has kind of been the difference since we we won. I think that playoff semi final against Sheffield United, where we thought we were going to bottle it, but then the fans just stepped up again. I think that was the thing that broke the the, the camel's back, so to speak, with that. So in the stadium, I agree massively. It's more outside of the stadium where I mean, I'm in a different <laughs> country, so it's most of the time when I'm with fan groups or online or whatever. You know what I mean? A bit, bit of a sliding doors moment, maybe that Sheffield United it kind of broke the. Um... Yeah, just broke the duct, didn't it? Kind of broke the curve. Gibbs white off them. Oh, it was brilliant. Ruined them. Ruined yeah. them. And then they come I, up trying to get redemption last season and they're awful. It was great. I don't know if you've seen his uh, his recent interview with Sky Sports. He's talking about like football memorabilia and memories. Oh, and I stuff. saw it. He's obviously spoke about being a Man United fan, unfortunately. Um, <sighs> but like he was saying about like some, they said something, he says like, oh, have you got any football regrets? And he says, well, kind of but not because he says like everything happens for a reason he's like because obviously i missed the penalty against forest in the playoffs but if i'd scored it would i be here like and then like the interview said like, oh yeah sliding doors moment kind of butterfly effects kind of thing like yeah set his set his pathway almost to to be where he is today and he's he's probably one of the most exciting number 10s in the league currently I, 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 would, I would say i mean I, I think even like what I enjoyed last season, we, we lost that game against Chelsea three two, but the atmosphere was just so much fun until they scored the winner, obviously because it was like, oh god, we actually have to get a kind of get a result against Burnley, but it didn't really matter because the goal difference was ridiculous. But like that Murillo chant going round, I think Harry Toffolo's uh, chant, even though he's like a bit part player, but we just all love him because of of who he is was just brilliant and like like you said and obviously the Man U game I mean that's when me you and Matt first met in, in, yeah. in person which was really fun day I was watching Chelsea nearly bottle against Luton in, 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 the, in the pub and then uh, walked to the ground and everything and that was that was a really good day but uh, just to finish off Chris and, and before you go what is what is the forest all over red hot take for the season I'm really intrigued to hear it well, that fair play for you, for branding the red hot take. I mean, no, we it is, it is, like, well, I like to think the slept on it for it's a kind of like our thing. It's Lee Clark's thing, um, but and, and the, the red hot take is is the is the forest all over thing. Okay, uh, my I'll, I'll do two red hot takes, right? Yeah. So Matt recently has done a couple of red hot takes. If anyone doesn't know what they are, they're sort of a controversial thing that may come true. One of his was. At the time when Scarpa came, he said, Scarpa will never score a goal for Forrest. He didn't, so he got it right. And he said at the start of the, the, the sort of window, he said that we'll keep Murillo and Gibbs White, which I thought was an impossibility. So he's got them right, and he's very smug about that. Um, Matt's my co-host, by the way. Uh, well, the, the, so, the Murillo and Gibbs White thing is not a foregone conclusion. The transfer window is not finished yet. So I agree. I, so so that I've stood by that as well, right? And because I, I, and I, I want Matt to be wrong. I am well, not I don't counting. want him to be wrong. I want him to be right, but I am not counting yeah. my chips on that one yet. I, yeah. I, until, until that window firmly shuts, which I always think it should shut like before the first game of the season. I just think like they should open it earlier and then like close it before the first game. Like it makes no sense to me. But anyway, carry on. Sorry. No, so no, it's fine. Uh, anyway, look, my, my my two red hot takes. My my primary red hot take is I think Marrera will break into the team. Um, I've only seen. Uh, a couple of weeks of him. He looks really good. Uh, he is now going to be the backup for Williams going forward. I think Williams starts for me, no doubt. But I, I just have a feeling Marrera, he looks so much better than I thought he was. He just looks so much better than I thought he was going to be. 
And that's my red hot take because I think he breaks into the team. Uh, and then I'll give you another one, a bit of a, more of a fun one. Um, my red hot take is Milenkovic scores, if he gets 30 plus games, he doesn't get injured. Milenkovic scores five goals next season. Wow. I mean, I'd take it. Um, absolutely. Because we, we lack a, a threat from set pieces, really, don't we? I think we're going to uh, change that. And I think Milenkovic is, is going to be right in there. And I think he'll score five goals if he gets 30 plus games. They're my two yeah. red hot takes. I mean, towards the end of the last season, I thought our, our delivery of of corners and 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 set pieces looked a lot more threatening. Um, we was, we scored scored a few, didn't we? Like we scored against Sheffield United there, we scored against Chelsea, um, gives White scored against Wolves if I remember correctly. So the, we were starting to creep in a few. We just need to creep in a few more and then keep about like half of what we let what we let in last season out of our own bloody. Back. Oh, we've signed to do that anyway. Miguel six we've, foot eight yeah, keeper, Milankovic in the defence. Omavamadeli's tall. We've we've signed to stop set pieces. So that's yeah. that's that's a positive. We're making like big wholesale changes to oh. to. You know, don't, um, don't need a set piece slash. coach. We just need big blokes. That's all we need. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Chris, thank you very much for joining us on Red Side of the Trend. Obviously, anyone that does not follow or have listened to Forest all over, I, I'm not someone that advocates podcasts unless I don't believe they're God. And Chris and Matt are absolutely two peas in a pod in terms of Forest fans. It like epitomise. Your mates in a pub. This is how I'm going to describe. It. I'm I'm doing the advert for you, by the way. Good right. man. Two blokes in a pub who love Forest, hate each other, could be a married couple, but then do kiss and make up when we do win, lose, or draw. It does not matter. Um, and bicker. I've never known anything like it. Um, yeah. I reckon you we, probably we have lived, more arguments. Look, we you know each other. We lived together arguments. for years. So you, I'm. I would. I would love to see you guys. Put on a pair of gloves and smack each other. I'm not going to lie; uh, it'd, be, it'd be brilliant. Um, <laughs> you, you, if I'll tell you some stories over a point of some of the, the the crazy arguments and things that we did back 20, 15, 20 years ago. But um, thanks very much. That's really kind. Like there's so many podcasts out there, you know, from this to Forest Focus to Miss Rolling In to you know all the others that I haven't mentioned. Um, you know, but there's there's loads of Forest podcasts out there that do really good content. We Ours is based around forests all over the world. So it's, you know, we we started off four years ago getting people from different parts of the world on because I was living in Toronto at the time and Matt was in the UK. So we it's it's kind of based around that. And we we, we do semi-regularly have guests on from different parts of the world. We'll probably do that weekly now coming into the new season. So, but the, the, the part of the show, I suppose, you're talking about is the, the two hosts, me and Matt, who do generally do post-match together. And it, it's... <laughs> generally never agree on anything and i don't know if he's doing it on purpose <laughs> half the time but uh, it, it certainly feels like that it's just carnage um just a quick question actually about the forest all over where's the furthest person you've spoke to from okay uh, so matt will be able to pinpoint this china uh was pretty good um hawaii but i was living in canada at the time so i was closer to them but hawaii yeah, but was in, in terms of from nottingham i guess uh, is what i'm saying Sorry, no, where's no. the furthest person in the world? Or would yeah, you say, yeah, that, that supports Forest that you've spoken yeah. to. Yeah, so China. I think there was well, there was a lad from Nottingham who was in China at the time. Was that Ollie, Ollie Haig. Ollie, or... yeah, it was Ollie. Yeah, no, Ollie. We did him like three years ago, I think. Um, we had Bermuda, Bahamas, loads, uh, Hawaii. There was a bloke who was like he was in the army and he was in his army truck doing a video, <laughs> and he was trying to check the scores in the woods while he was on training. And he was an American dude, absolute legend. Shout out to him, Michael. Um, so th that was one really special one I remember at the beginning. Australia, we've done a couple of times, but we're always looking for the furthest out places. I think Richard Spray from Oklahoma said there's someone in New Zealand who's his cousin um, who, who will try and get on. But yeah, top of my head, China was pretty special, I remember. And then... Um, yeah, Hawaii was special because of just the nature of where he was and he was in the woods and stuff. That was pretty cool. So we, yeah. we'll be doing loads more of that like in the coming season. So hopefully we get... Look, if there's any people from the furthest day possible place listening to this podcast, give us a shout out because we'll, we'll we'll bring you on. Yeah, I mean, you're going to bring the American fan base to, to uh, the city ground, I feel, Chris. So good work. Um, 
obviously check it all out for us all over on Spotify, Apple, Twitter. All the links will be in the description below. Um, until next time, we'll see you. We'll see you soon. Um, yeah, seasons are foot. I uh, can't wait. Um, we're all very excited. But until next time, we'll see you then. Come on, you Reds.